Hello, fellow Rebel Capitalists here with my good buddy, Jeff Snyder. And we are going to do a super advanced deep dive on the monetary system. I am very, very excited for this because, Jeff, you know, you're out there all the time talking about the Eurodollar market and the banking system and how the Fed really isn't the center of the monetary system. But uh, boy, oh boy, that it, it's, it's really difficult for people to uh, not only... Uh, get the concepts, but follow the, the train of thought because we're told from day one that the Fed prints money or even that the Fed creates bank reserves and there's this money multiplier and therefore the banks have more balance sheet capacity and therefore they're going to lend more uh, or that the bank, uh, the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates and therefore that creates more demand for loans and that creates more M2 money supply through the banks lending it into existence. Why don't we start with a very, uh, the kind of the reader's digest version as, or the elevator pitch as to why you think that is incorrect? Other than it's the actual history. <laughs> I mean, you can go back as you've done, George, you go back and, and, uh, First of all, you start with the academic scholarship. You do the research and you actually listen to what the Federal Reserve officials have said through history. And they tell you that story. Uh, Alan Greenspan famously in the 1990s kept saying over and over and over again, we don't know how to monitor the monetary system. We don't know how to define money. And so it's not a hard leap to go from a central bank that doesn't know how to define money to a central bank that doesn't do monetary policy. And that's really where interest rate targeting came from. Interest rate targeting was a central bank is supposed to directly impact the money supply, right? We're supposed to create print friggin' notes or something, do whatever it takes to make sure that the currency is elastic. And that's what central banks did traditionally. But in the 1960s and 70s, the Fed under the great inflation kind of lost touch with everything. And so by the 1980s, and Greenspan even said 1982, we were targeting an interest rate. That's not money. That's not monetary um, monetary policy. That's a workaround to get around monetary policy because you don't know money. And so Alan Greenspan said, we did this because we didn't have any alternative. We basically lost touch with the monetary system. And the only way that we could, could the only way that we saw that we could continue to do the mandates that were given to us by Congress was to try to manipulate an interest rate which you and I both know is not monetary policy. That's more of a communications effort than anything else. Yeah, but let's let's stop right there because that's where I think we can take this from just the words that we're saying to or theory and take it straight to the charts and take it straight to the data. So can you tell the viewer how the Federal Reserve supposedly managed interest rates prior to QE because now it's just IOR. So the interest rate is this, that's what we're paying you on reserves. But prior to QE, people forget that the Federal Reserve did not pay uh, interest on those bank reserves. So how was the, the, the mechanism to which they would increase or lower interest rates based on the textbook? Well, the mechanism was the FOMC would get together and they would target a federal funds rate. Right. And so then let's, just they say, would, let's just say 4%. Yeah. They just pick a number out of the air. And it, there was no, I mean, there's no math behind it. It was basically FDR picking a gold price after the uh, confiscation. They just come up with a number and the number comes up with how do we want to signal to the real economy what we're doing? So if they're in, if their previous target was 3% and they want to signal that they're tightening money, which they're not actually tightening money, they want to signal they're tightening money, they would pick three and a quarter or three and a half, whatever the case may be. It's all about the signaling effect. And so what they do is the FOMC gets together. They get together with all the banks. They have conversations before they even get to the vote. And everybody knows ahead of time what they're going to do. So by the time the FOMC votes to say, we're going to raise the, F the federal funds target rate from 4% to say four and a quarter, everybody already knows that it's a, it's a fait accompli. Everybody knows it's going to happen. And then what happens is the banking system adjusts. So all of the dealer banks that are in the federal funds market, they start they start um, transacting and charging in federal funds four and a quarter percent. The Federal Reserve doesn't actually do anything. It just says that if there is something that happens that causes the federal funds rate to move too far away from our target in either direction, we will do something to make sure that it goes back to where it belongs. And so throughout the 
1980s and 1990s and the first half of the 2000s, you know how many times the Fed had to do anything? It was basically nothing. The banking system took care of all of the details. So the banks would charge what the Federal Reserve said it would it would it would defend their target if they ever had to and the banks would just simply alter their lending books based on what the Federal Reserve picked. And you got to remember the we talked about this before, George, the, the, the Federal Reserve and the banking system worked hand in glove. It wasn't like they were at odds with each other. And this isn't some conspiracy either. It's just that's part of the mechanism. So when the Fed says we would like the federal funds rate to be four and a quarter, all the banks said, OK, we'll start charging four and a quarter. That sounds good to us. Well, let's so the banking a, system carried out all the transactions. Right. But let's assume for a moment that they were using these bank reserves to settle, that they were a vital component of the monetary system. So if, let's just assume there was this, uh, um, let's say the amount of demand for bank reserves was at this level. And the Federal Reserve said, okay, well, what we're doing is we're increasing interest rates. So to your point, all the entities in the monetary system, they just increase the level at which they are willing to lend. But if there was demand for reserves, then you would assume that the amount of reserves and the system would have had to have gone up or because if the dealers just said, yes. okay, well, we'll just take it up to 4.5%. Okay, fine. How are you going to do that if there's not more or less bank reserves in the system? How, how are you going to do that without open market operations? So in my view, and tell me your view, the fact that the Fed didn't have to do any open market operations at all proves that the banks or the dealers weren't using bank reserves to begin with. They were using bank reserves, but they were not the primary settlement tool, right? You're exactly right. If there was an increase in demand or increased demand for use of bank reserves as a settlement instrument, then the Fed would have had to increase or decrease the supply of reserves to meet their federal funds target. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's what changed in the 1970s and 80s. The Fed found that there was no relationship there. And so the, the, the federal funds target wasn't really about bank reserves and the quantity or lack of quantity of money. It was all about trying to signal to the economy. And if there was ever an issue where the banking system said, you know, we don't like this, then, then the Fed might have had to do some kind of open market operation to raise or lower reserves. But that was usually unrelated. Uh, for an example, in 1998, tax collections were really large because of the dot-com era. Mm -hmm. And so there was a shortfall because you know a lot of money moved from the TT&L accounts and the commercial banking system. Which, to, to be clear, was the, was the previous version of the TGA. Just to right. So the government ta tax balances went up, which kind of drained the system of liquidity. And so the federal funds rate started to get really screwy. In fact, it went up, I think, 20, 30 basis points. It was pretty a pretty substantial increase around April 15th tax day. And so the Fed supplied reserves because there was a shortfall in liquidity in the system in that one instance. And that's really all the Fed did was try to smooth over any non-economic unrelated rough patches in the money markets that were due to other reasons than the, the actual demand for money in the real economy. Right. And, and, and here's another train of thought here that I'd like your view on. Uh, if there was a direct correlation or a direct necessity for bank reserves, if that was the be all end all, then you would assume that we could use M2 money supply or even bank credit as a proxy for how much activity banks were doing, therefore how much need there was for bank reserves. So if we look at a chart here, Jeff, of the uh, reserves, to your point, we're, we're effectively zero, right? But before um, 2008, and uh, another thing that I'd add to this that I don't know if you've gone over this in your videos, but I actually looked at the H3 data that, that not only shows the total of amount, uh, amount of reserves, but it breaks it down by uh, electronic reserves held at the Fed and right. actual vault cash. Right. Now, I don't know if this vault cash is at a bank or held at the Fed. I haven't been able to, I've done a lot of research, but I haven't been able to figure that out. You know, you can't it also be held at the really treasury quick. or, oh, okay. Well, as long as it's not held at the federal reserve, I would assume that this component of reserves is not really ideal for settlement, no. right? Be because they're not going to take a Brinks truck full of cash and send it to bank of America, especially in the 1990s 
when you can just do that electronically. Um, so therefore, I think we can say that if there's uh, $8 billion, and I'm using specific examples, $8.7 billion worth of electronic reserves uh, in, let's say, December of 2007, uh, there was, you know, the balance of that, let's just say, uh, whatever, $35 billion would be an actual vault cash. So we, we can assume that even if you're looking at a $43 billion amount of bank reserves, that not all of that was available for the actual settlement process. It would probably be closer to, to, to 10 or something like that. So then you tell me, how does M2 Money Supply go from $1.5 trillion up to $7.5 trillion domestically, and then dollar global let's just say uh, M2 uh, money supply, how, how does that go up to, let's just say 40 trillion in uh, 2008, while the amount of reserves used for or available for settlement was 10 billion? To, to me, that math doesn't work. It's what a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Right, that's my point. Yeah, it's so small. And that's exactly right because banks were using other forms of settlement that were on their own, they're in their own system. Yeah. You know, that's, a, that's one thing, George, you pointed out. Um, negative interest rates have done us a favor here because they showed how banks don't want to use physical settlement instruments. Because say a European bank that was getting charged negative rates under the NERP uh, regime, which still, I mean, um, that wasn't that long ago. In J Japan, they're still having a negative interest rate. So in a negative interest rate re regime where you're getting charged for having electronic reserves with a central bank, you do have the right to convert to physical cash. And that was all you hear people, oh, banks are going to convert to cash. They're going to convert to cash. And they never did. Because what they were saying is that the, the cost of paying that negative interest rate for electronic reserves was worth absorbing rather than using cash, which is in, the cost of using cash must be at a greater cost than having to pay for having electronic reserves. So cash, physical cash is an expensive proposition to banks. And it's really a relic of an age old system that doesn't exist. The only reason banks ever hold physical cash is for the occasional customer, the depositor who wants to use cash for hand to hand transactions. But that hasn't been a, that hasn't been a substantial part of the commercial system in a century. So right. physical cash is an encumbrance and a very big one. And one reason why we use so much electronic settlement is because that's the most efficient way to do business. It's, Physical, the physical world is hugely expensive. Before we move on, I want to show the viewers uh, a chart of bank credit because although this is not perfect, this is a, a proxy for bank lending uh, that if you listen to the mainstream, you would assume is dependent upon the amount of reserves in the system. The more reserves the banks have, the more they can lend. Uh, people see banks as intermediaries, they see banks as uh, entities that lend money as opposed to create money. Therefore, if I have more money bank, or uh, if I have more money, Jeff, then obviously I can lend more. But if that was true, I want the viewers to look at this chart really quick, just take a mental snapshot of that, of bank reserves prior to QE, and then look at bank credit. So again, uh, what, what's interesting here, if you actually look at a log chart, you see that the percentage of increase in bank credit, say from uh, you know 1985 to 2000 or from 2000 to uh, 2007, uh, the percentage of increase with no reserves, effectively zero reserves in the system, was greater than what we've seen since QE and taking the bank reserves from 40 billion up to call it 3.5 trillion. So I, I don't know how one would explain this increase in bank credit uh, being more extreme when we had zero reserves if everything revolves around reserves. Yeah, and it's even worse than that, George, as I know you're getting into is that the rate of change after 2008 is, and as you refer to, you know, put it on a log chart and you can really see it. Yeah. Because people look at that chart and say, look, look, you know, the bank credit seems to continue to grow and it's it's expanding, but it's actually expanding at a much reduced rate. Correct. In the era 
where there are lots of bank reserves, which you would think would be the opposite way around, right? If the Fed is creating all of the bank reserves, why isn't there more lending? And really that chart shows you there is a lot less lending or the rate of change in lending is substantially less ever since the Fed started increasing bank reserves. And it goes back to the, the major issue here is about what people have as a mental concept of a bank itself. Right. We have the idea that a bank is a storehouse of money and therefore it creates the fractional reserve multiplication process where we're, if you put more money into the vault, the, vent, the, the bank could then make more loans off of the same amount of money. But that wasn't really the case even back way back when, when we actually did have a fractional reserve multiplication system. It wasn't so simple as more money goes in, more loans come out. There was never a direct relationship there to begin with. But that's where the problem starts. People have this concept of a bank as you put money in a vault, therefore more loans should come out of it. So if the Fed bank reserves count as money, that means there's more money in bank vaults, so there should be more credit flowing out of the bank. But right. that's that's just not how banking works. And so you have to deconstruct people's concept of what banks are, what really money is, in order to get to more to where you're going here, which is how do we how do we reconcile all of these mainstream theories with actual facts and evidence? And it really starts with you guys have banks all wrong and you have money all wrong and you got to reorient your thinking to the way it actually works. And I want to be clear. It's I don't think it's it's it's, it's not people's fault. No, no, no. I, no, I, yeah, I had this exact this same view because it's very intuitive. Yes. It's very intuitive. Right. Yes. A bank gets money. Uh, they lend out that money. If they get ten dollars, they can lend out nine dollars. So if they have a thousand dollars, they can lend out nine hundred dollars. That's just this just makes sense. Yeah, that's and it, it, economics has done such a poor job of educating people of how things work for a yeah. variety of reasons. One is people, economists don't care about this stuff anymore. And they haven't cared about this really for a very long period of time. So as far as banking and money goes in most mainstream economics, they don't care. It's just we don't we don't we're not concerning ourselves with that. So most people are left. I think because they think it's it's too simple for them to even research. I, I actually is, think that's true because they're like, Jeff, why on earth? In fact, I had a, a, a back and forth on Twitter on the spaces the other day uh, with some a, a guy that was very intelligent. And um, I was trying to go over this stuff. And I asked him, you know, what on earth can a bank do with um, X amount of bank reserves that they can't do with Y? Let, let's just break this. And he wouldn't he almost wouldn't even answer the question because he thought it was so stupid. He's like, look, you, you, you didn't say this, but uh, he's, he's basically saying, look, you idiot. I'm not even going to address that question because obviously if the banks have more assets, they can lend more. If the banks have more money, they can lend more money. Why are we even debating this? And then right, he that's... told me that I was dangerous. My ideas were literally oh. dangerous. And I, but I don't blame him for that because if you're coming at this from the view that well, duh, George, if banks have more money, of course they can lend more. If you're saying something other than that, then, and you've got all these followers, then obviously you're misrepresenting the facts, whether it's intentional or because you're stupid. You're misinformation, yeah. Therefore, this is misinformation. Therefore, yep. this is dangerous. So I don't blame him for saying that. No, but what you and I are both doing is saying, look, we're presenting the evidence for you. We're uncovering the, we're doing the historical research. Don't take my word for it. I say this all the time. Don't take my word for it. Do the research for yourself. Think about this. Look at the evidence that George is presenting and say, how can this possibly make sense given the facts that we have? And that's the thing. These are facts. These are not our opinions. These aren't numbers we're making up out of thin air. These are facts. How do you explain the facts given the current state of, what our supposed worldview is. And you can't, you really can't. And I'd like it, to add, Jeff, that this was bank credit, but you can look at the S&P 500 and it's the exact same thing. Right. If you look at the S&P 500 from, I think I did a, a, a video the other day where I talked about from 1985 to 2000 and then look at it from uh, you know 2009 or so to today. And it went up way more uh, in terms of percentage uh, with absolutely no reserves in the system. So if anything, I, I, I think there's an argument that reserves actually decrease bank lending and reserves actually 
have made the stock market lower than it otherwise would have been. I'm not saying that's my position, <laughs> but I'm saying that you could you actually make that case. That, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, that's, I, go ahead. that's you're getting closer to the actual truth. When you actually stop and examine the evidence and whether it be financial variables or economic variables, what you see is that they seem to perform markedly worse during the period when central banks are creating a lot of reserves. And that should lead people to the next question. Well, how the hell could that be? How can the economy have less inflation when the central bank is creating more reserves? How can the economy grow much at a much reduced rate when the central bank is ultra engaged in ultra accommodative policies? What is ever stimulated by all of this stimulus? Because whenever central banks are engaging in their heaviest stimulus, things are usually not going well. And so yeah. that leads us into the, the next stage, which is what are central banks actually doing? What are these actual, what are these reserves other than a, a uh, interbank settlement token that some banks can use to settle various, uh, you know, their own live, their own uh, instruments. Jeff, another thing I want to highlight before we move on, and I, I've given this a lot of thought, I'd, I'd like your opinion, is I think it's safe to assume prior to QE, there was some disadvantage for the banks to settle on the Fed's balance sheet. Because we know that if the demand for reserves would have uh, been higher, the Fed would have provided those reserves. Uh, they, I've read many reports, uh, annual summaries from open market operations in the 1990s, where they explicitly say that they create the amount of reserves based on how much demand they think there will be for those reserves. So if, the, if we can safely assume the banks weren't using reserves, then I think we can also safely assume that there was some sort of disadvantage to settling on the Fed's balance sheet, or said another way, an advantage to simply settling on the commercial bank's balance sheets themselves. How do you view that? Euro dollar. <laughs> so the euro dollar was it's just- that simple. Just there was so many advantages to taking money and finance in U.S. dollar terms, outside the United States. And so if you're outside the United States, it's just easier to conduct in the monetary forms that are usable outside the United States. Even though you're taking more risk, because let, let's be fair here, that, that they are taking slightly more risk by settling uh, on uh, another bank's balance sheet without settling in actual bank reserves. Because their, yeah. their, their offsetting asset, let's say, is credit from another bank instead of those green pieces of paper or instead of the bank reserve. So, so they are taking more risk. So my point there is there has to be much more reward to compensate for that risk by not settling on the Fed's balance sheet. Yeah, I and mean, that's China, India, and the rest of the emerging markets, the Asian tigers. Uh, there was obviously more reward to taking finance in U.S. dollar terms outside the United States. Mm -hmm. And I would I would counter that the perception of risk at the time, whether whether right or wrong um, in the 90s, it was probably more right than wrong. The perception of settling on, say, Bank of America's balance sheet versus the Federal Reserve, there was no difference there. Uh, as far as most people were concerned, a correspondent relationship with a large even it didn't even need to be a U.S. bank. A large European bank that had been in the U.S. dollar, but our Swiss bank, a large Swiss bank that had been in foreign currency business for centuries. There was basically very little risk perceived or real for settling with a correspondent relationship with banks around the rest of the world versus the Federal Reserve. And so if all of the incentives are outside the United States and there's this massive infrastructure that had been in place for decades and had been routinely tested over and over again, the risk of doing more monetary business outside the United States was perceived or not was very slim. Plus, that's where all the growth and opportunity was anyway. So basically, the entire incentive structure going back to the 1950s and 60s was to push everything offshore. Right. And the more stuff went offshore, the less there was use or demand for the Federal Reserve. It's just, I mean, that, it's that simple. Let me play devil's advocate. Let's assume that uh, now it's just flat out different than it was prior to 2008. I mean, as an example, we've got all of these banking regulations. I'm sure you know them better than I do. We've got Basel III. We've got, uh, what is it, SLR requirements. 
So we have all these things that have been set up by the central planners that actually require the banks to have a lot more of these bank reserves, whether they want them or they don't. So under this type of environment where we have all these additional regulations, the structure of the monetary system has changed fundamentally to a point where if the Fed creates more reserves, then that actually is creating more liquidity because of the central planners have changed the way um, these banks have to manage their balance sheet. Well, the banks changed their own balance sheets way before we got to the regulations to begin with. But see, that's the thing. We need to define what we say. We say liquidity. What do we actually mean there? So what the Federal Reserve has done by creating bank reserves, if they've, they've created a liquid asset, but is a, having a liquid asset the same as systemic liquidity? Because... I can hold I can hold a trillion dollars, you know, let's, let's be more realistic. I can hold a hundred million dollars in bank reserves, or I could hold a hundred million dollars in physical Federal Reserve notes. And if I don't do anything with those, it's not liquidity. I just have a liquid asset on my balance sheet. Maybe I want a liquid asset because I'm afraid of the, the environment. I just I just want to have that liquid asset in case things really go bad and I need to make payments that I'm not I'm not prepared for. So having a liquid asset is not the same as having liquidity. Liquidity is where those liquid assets are dependably traded throughout the system. So that if you don't have liquid assets, you can get liquid assets at a moment's notice because there's a dependable money market available or a credit market or whatever the case may be. So the Federal Reserve has created liquid assets and then some regulations later on said, we need you to hold these liquid assets, but that's not the same thing as liquidity. That just means that banks are holding more liquid assets. But what if banks are holding more liquid assets because they're scared as hell of the entire financial and global economic environment? So you're holding liquid assets as a defensive measure in addition to regulations. So you're going to be unwilling to do anything whether you have liquid assets or not. It always comes down to the same thing. Money needs to circulate. In order for money to circulate, you have to have willing participants. And if participants aren't willing to circulate money, it doesn't matter how much money you create if you call it money or not. It's well, it's it's always about circulation. So the Fed creates a liquid asset that qualifies as a liquid asset for regulatory purposes, but is that the same thing as liquidity? Right. And the way I always say this, you know, uh, you've heard this many times, is it just boils down to risk. It, it always it, does. It, it just, Historically it speaking, just boils going, down to, to you go risk. back to ancient times, and it's the same thing. You know? yeah. Human beings are human beings. We we create new forms to be stupid with, then we get really stupid, and then afterward, we're like, oh, man, it was really stupid. I don't want to do that again. Until you go a long period of time where we start taking more risk, and then we get really stupid in a different, completely different way, but it's really the same thing. We just go back and forth time and time again. And when you look at it that way, you can see the Fed's bank reserves as a response to the, oh, crap, we were stupid. Now we're not going to do that again. So yep. banks don't want to lend. And the Fed is actually giving them the tools so that they don't have to lend. They don't have to create more liquid liabilities. The Fed is actually going to do it for you. So in many respects, you know, equating bank reserves with liquidity, that's the same. That's the same problem as thinking about banks as a fractional reserve multiplier money in the bank type of, of framework. Yeah, I was on a live stream the other day with our uh, mastermind group, which which you've uh, spoken at before. And uh, I, I said, look, because they're asking me ways that they could measure risk or the, the risk that is perceived within the banking system uh, itself. And I said, well, one, you could look at the curve, uh, but two, you could probably just look at the Fed's balance sheet. Um, because if yep. the Fed's balance sheet is going up, then the, you can pretty much de, uh, count on the fact that the perceived risk is also going up. Or why wouldn't they take their balance sheet back down to where it was prior to uh, QE in the first place? Right. Um, oh, yeah, but, there's always because remember, the Fed is always reacting to something that's already happening. Yeah. And the something that's already happening is the vastly more important part. Yeah. Let, let's. Focus on the regulations for a moment, because let's assume for a minute the risk went down for some reason. Uh, so the curve is steepening. We got a bull steepener. Now all of a sudden, Fed funds is at five percent, and the ten years at whatever seven or something like that. So now all of a sudden, uh, we see that uh, signals 
or the perceived risk within the banking system going down to, to very low levels. Um, my position there would be, yes, there are regulations in place that might prevent them from doing X, Y, and Z, but we also had a regulation uh, prior to 2020 called reserve requirements. And if you go back and look, th this was the nothing burger of all nothing burgers, that it was a, a rule, it was a regulation, just like Basel III or SLR, but the banks basically gave the Fed the middle finger <laughs> and said, you know, okay, you have fun with your little reserve requirement there. What we're going to do is we're going to set up all these sweep accounts that aren't applicable to your stupid reserve requirement, and we're just going to get around with it, and we're not even going to hide it. We're just going to do it right in front of your face. And I read um, responses from uh, Alan Greenspan regarding these sweep accounts, and he he knew that they were doing it. He he, he knew that they were doing it, and he admitted that they were ma moving this money into uh, accounts that weren't uh, applicable to these reserve requirements. So my position was like, okay, Alan, well, if you really thought these reserve requirements matter, why or or saved you know created safety why wouldn't you um move those reserve requirements to the sweep accounts why would you just let them get away with it and so the fact that they did this and the fed admitted it the banks did it right in front of their face i don't know why they wouldn't do the same thing with basel 3 or slr i mean does basel 3 and slr have uh some sort of you know teeth that uh, the reserve requirements didn't, or ha I'm sure you've studied that. So what's your view there? Yeah, the, they do have a little bit more of a comprehensive, um, but with reserve requirements, banks got around that because they were basically employing non-banks. And so they went outside the regulatory structure of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve could not regulate money market funds, which were actually separate entities. So they're basically hey, let's push everything outside the banking system, which is what banks have been doing since, again, regulations have existed. Um, with the SLR and Basel III and Dodd-Frank to a certain extent, I believe the only reason they really have any teeth is because the banking system as a whole doesn't perceive a whole lot of opportunity to going around them. If there was a- That's my a point. Robust, let's assume risk goes way down to where now all of a sudden they're like, yeah, let's go nuts. They would do it. I guarantee right. you they would find their way around it right. because that's how finance works. It's not about risk. It's about a risk adjusted return. If you perceive the, uh, the risk adjusted return as being high enough, no matter what stands in your way, you'll, you'll pay the cost to take advantage of that opportunity. And so if the opportunity is I have to do something that's going to uh, put me into conflict with existing regulations, or it's going to, I'm going to be bound by the SLR. I'm going to find a way around the SLR. As long as it's worth it to do so, the banking system will find a way to do it. And I think the reason why the SLR appears to be so binding is the banks are saying, we see no reason to expand our balance sheets. We see no reason to take on risk here. So let's just live as sort of a boring public utility rather than what we used to be, which were these really ultra stupid hedge funds taking risks on anything and ignoring every possible uh, restraint. Yeah, That's really where it is. And I mean, look at 2020 and 2021. What did the banking system do? They expanded their balance sheet for US treasuries and bank reserves. Basically the safest thing on earth. They didn't go nuts lending to businesses. They didn't go nuts lending to you and me. They just, they bought a bunch of treasuries. And then as soon as the the uh, the treasury deluge was over, they went right back to lowering uh, to uh, constraining their own balance sheets again. That wasn't regulation. That wasn't monetary policy. That was the banking system as a whole in its yeah. post-crisis era. Yeah, it goes back to the, the, co the causation correlation debate back and forth that you sit there. Oh, my gosh, look at how well these regulations are working, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> when in reality, the bank's like, hey, we, we, we don't want to we don't want to lend. You know, they worked really well even before they were ever instituted. <laughs> Those regulations were working great in August of 2007, even though they were three years down the road. So that's the thing. You know, banks changed their behavior long before the regulations came along. Yeah, it, it, it's almost like interest rates are going down. Then the Fed responds by lowering yes. interest rates. <laughs> it, it's it's like the, the, the same the type famous of famous Richard movement. Fisher quote, the old Dallas Fed president. He's like, why are we buying assets the market's already buying? <laughs> because that's not <laughs> what we're supposed to be doing.
Yeah. So now let me go ahead and and push back a little, Jeff, on uh, something, not even playing devil's advocate, but maybe something I disagree with you okay. uh, on. And I was watching, and by the way, guys, if you haven't subscribed to Jeff's service, I, I don't know what you're waiting for. Um, it is, uh, you know, what's interesting is for me, I pretty much don't hold anything back on YouTube or my podcast. I, I give you my opinion. I, I don't hold anything back. So you won't get any of my views behind a paywall like Rebel Capitalist uh, Pro uh, that you don't get by just watching my v YouTube videos, but they're consolidated and they're more structured. And then of course we've got Brent and Lynn and, and Chris and all the amazing uh, pros there. But you actually save like 99% <laughs> of the mind blowing, incredible stuff for the paywall, it's just a decision that you make. So again, if you're a fan of Jeff's or this type of, uh, or this topic, you've, you've got to check out Euro Dollar University. But I was watching one of your videos, this is my point, that you're doing with Emil, and you're saying how the when the Fed does QE, it's basically an asset swap. And the example that you used is if a bank has a mortgage-backed security, it, they most likely have it for a reason. And then the uh, Fed comes in, buys that mortgage-backed security, and then they replace it with a a bank reserve that uh, the bank may or may not want. Uh, but that doesn't really increase the size of the bank's balance sheet. Do you remember that conversation? Yep. Okay. So what I was thinking when you were saying that is I was thinking, yes, I totally agree with you guys. If the when the Fed is doing QE, that the bank is actually selling the treasury. But what if it's a non-bank? Because if it's a non-bank, then it does increase the balance sheet of the banking system by adding an additional bank reserve, but also an additional deposit liability. So uh, what's your view on the Fed doing QE, but uh, if non-banks are selling treasuries instead of banks? The non-banks can't sell to the Fed. So are you talking about non-banks selling to commercial banks? Uh, no, I'm talking about, so the way, and maybe I've got this wrong, but the way I saw the, the, the system is the fed does open market operations. And this is a conversation I believe I've had with Joseph before, but anyway, uh, so the fed says, Hey, we want to buy, uh, let's just say a billion dollars worth of treasuries. So the, 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 the New York trading desk will go out and buy those treasuries, but they can't specifically say, hey, we want to buy from banks. They're just buying on the open market. So it's all predicated upon who's actually selling. But maybe I've got that wrong. Uh, but even, even if that's the case, the Fed can't give bank reserves to a non-bank. So the yeah, Fed would actually have to transact through a third party, and then the third party would be credited with bank reserves, and the third party bank would then have to credit the non-bank buyer Correct. with some form of a deposit a deposit asset. Correct. So, but in that case, although it's, it's kind of a net wash because the bank is receiving a bank reserve, but they're also receiving an offsetting deposit liability because that non-bank entity, let's just say they have an account with Wells Fargo. So they deposit that money that they received uh, from the Fed by selling them a treasury. Uh, they deposit that their savings account, Wells Fargo, so that goes up by a thousand bucks then the uh, Fed sends Wells Fargo the $1,000 of the bank reserves. In that scenario or in that example, um, although there's an offsetting liability, the actual size of the balance sheet has increased. So the, the bank may not have sold that mortgage-backed security, but now they've got an additional bank reserve as well as an additional deposit liability. And I think the argument could be made that, okay, now you've got this additional bank reserve, so you do have additional liquidity from the standpoint of being able to settle on the Fed's balance sheet or do something with that reserve if you so choose. Well, I think the more to play on your side of the, the, the better argument is that, and you do see this, you see a relationship between the Fed's QE and the increase in, say, checkable deposits in the system, because exact, that's exactly what happens. When the Fed buys through a third party, the third party has to create, if they don't already have some way to settle, they have to create a new deposit liability for the third party to sell the treasury to the, the broker, the custodian, right. and then the Federal Reserve credits them with the bank reserves. So there is a relationship between increasing depo checkable deposits and quantitative easing. But if that was actual money printing and there was some 
meaningful change to the commercial bank or the non-bank system, then why don't we ever see the effect in either lending, credit, or the economy? Why isn't there a noticeable boost, noticeable boost in economic activity? Why isn't there a noticeable increase in some form of downstream transaction from, hey, we created a new checkable deposit, it's being used. Why do we never see the effect of that so-called money printing? And this is one of the problems that I have when you get when you break down these transactions in the micro scale, you know, get out the T accounts and move them around because you're ignoring all of the other factors that go on in this thing. That there's we live in such a dynamic world, there's never a singular transaction where you can we can nail it down like a, you know, like quantum physics. We can get down to the quark level and say this is what actually happens. If that's really the case where the Fed is engaging in an indirect money printing arrangement with commercial banks by getting them to create checkable deposits in order to buy assets from, from third parties, then why don't we see the effects of money printing on the system? In, that's really it, that's what it comes down to in every instance where QE has ever been tried. There's no direct relationship with anything the central bank does in economic or financial variables. It just... It's all just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. We're creating now, this account from that account, and this account goes over here. And at the end of the day, it's net wash. It's zero. Yeah, let's – and just so um, I'm explaining this well because I think this is going to be – I know that hopefully you're going to have a discussion, another discussion with Lynn coming up here that I might moderate. And uh, so I, I want to go through this because I think this is going to help you understand her view better and her understand your view a little bit better as well. So when we look at M2 money supply, we're going to see it spike up. And I've read uh, reports from the Fed saying that the reason it did was uh, twofold. Number one, because some of the treasuries that they were buying were from non-banks and because uh, people started to draw off their lines of credit that was because the they thought the world was coming to an end. Right. Uh, so that's why you saw that M2. Now, what I would say uh, to, to this is what I would say to you about Lynn's view. What I would say to Lynn about uh, your view, or I, I, don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is if we are to assume that if the Fed buying a mortgage backed security from a bank or a treasury is just simply an asset swap, I don't think anyone disputes that. that that's kind of a no brainer. Um, it, it, we could also maybe say that about uh, the Fed buying from a non-bank from the standpoint of a, that treasury is basically a cash equivalent at zero velocity. So the, the, the fact that you're just trading a treasury that's on the balance sheet of a non-bank entity and replacing it with M2 money supply, it doesn't necessarily mean that those currency units are going to travel at any more velocity than that treasury would have. Uh, nor, and it also assumes that that treasury could not have been used to acquire purchasing power through by using as collateral and repo, as an example. Exactly. So exactly. I, uh, the way I say it, Jeff, is I, I not only want to look at M2, but I want to look at the difference between savings and checking, because that can give us some clues on velocity. But I also want to look at the aggregate balance sheet. So even if M2 is going up, if the aggregate balance sheet of non-bank entities is not, I don't know that that is necessarily purchasing power that's going to lead to consumer price inflation. It's yeah, it's it's, it's more complex. That's really the what it comes down to is that you want to make it into a simple arrangement where okay, if these people do this, then that must be money printing. Therefore, we have an increase in money supply, and there that's going to be inflationary. When what we're really talking about is, as you, you keep pointing out, velocity. Velocity is circulation, which is what's really right. important here. So if you have a non, even if they're a non-bank entity, say an insurance company that has a large reserve pool, the fact that they sell a mortgage bond to a third-party commercial bank, which then sells to the Fed, or they sell the mortgage bond to the Fed through the third-party commercial, it doesn't matter because if the non-bank is doing the same thing the bank would be doing, which is, they're just rejiggering the reserve balances. Instead of a mortgage bond, now they have a deposit credit at a commercial bank. And the commercial bank, instead of having a, uh, is now has a, a bank reserves and a deposit liability. So does any of that thing, does any of those transactions actually create anything meaningful in anything other than the balance sheets of the three parties that are involved? And that's really what it comes down to. 
Jeff, how about government deficit spending? Let's forget the Fed for a moment. Let's just forget the Fed. But if we can, if we assume that that is an asset swap between the Fed and a non-bank entity, wouldn't we also be able to argue that government deficit spending could be inflationary from the standpoint of it's increasing the aggregate balance sheet? Because all you're doing is taking savings and you're replacing it with M2. And that person, or excuse me, you're taking savings and replacing it with a treasury. So that person's uh, asset side of their balance sheet has not changed. But then you're taking that uh, savings and giving it to someone that's putting it in their checking account, let's say. And that is increasing the asset side of their balance sheet. So so the aggregate balance sheet has actually increased no, without the Fed. So do you think that's inflationary? I think it's, I don't want to call it inflationary because it depends on certain circumstances, but I look at it as government spending and government deficit spending in particular is redistribution. Because remember, we're talking about flow. We're talking about circulation. So what the government is doing is taking resources that might be sitting idle, right. like in a commercial bank balance sheet or whatever, and then redirecting them to people who would actually use the money. So they're acting as governments have done in the past during crisis periods, trying to redistribute monetary resources to those who would actually use them. So I would argue that the effect is more about velocity and circulation than it is about supply. Yeah. However, it doesn't last. There's maybe a one-time boost. And then, you know, the money goes out there in the system. It circulates a couple of times. And then it starts to slow down and starts to slow down and starts to slow down because the Keynesians are wrong about aggregate demand being a virtuous circle. What we see is that there's this rush, the sugar high. It actually creates a whole bunch of imbalances, some harmful, some not. And you hope there's less harmful ones than, than not harmful ones. But over time, it just it peters out. And usually in a lot of cases, you end up worse off for having gone through the, the, the process because of the distortions in the economic processes through non-economic means. So I think the government spending, as Japan has proven time and time again, it can have an impact as a recirculation and redistribution of money resources. But the reason it doesn't lead to, you know, 1970 style inflation is because it's not actually doing anything other than just rejiggering things, some things around to the less, the, you know, the idle parts of the economy to some of the more robust parts, but it, you know, only on a temporary basis. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, is it, is it safe to assume that your view of consumer price inflation in 20, 21, 2022 was a result of number one, supply chain disruption. And then maybe number two is velocity by just simply changing savings and turning it into checking or taking savings and turning it into checking. Just moving funds to where they could be yeah. used by people who were willing to use them. Yeah, right. Which is, I mean, a huge, and that's where the boost in demand came from. We all right. saw it. Everybody right. went shopping on Amazon. So right. we took, we took cash that was you know, banks were not going to do anything with it. They were all the companies that were drawing down on their, their liquidity revolvers in 2020. They were they were being reversed. Banks were already starting to cut back. So the government came in and said, we'll take some of that stuff. We'll borrow it through the treasury, treasury market and we'll throw it into the real economy to people who would use it. And they did. They used it for any number of things, not just real economy pur purchases through Amazon. Think about all the assets. People went nuts buying assets, financial assets. So, like, oh, let's buy some crypto, some MFT, all that kind of stuff. It was really, it's all about circulation and distribution. Um, and so the government is a powerful agent to recirculate resources, which uh, opens up a lot of doors. Like you're saying, central planning. I mean, if they get the idea that this is a good thing and they want to do more of it, I, it's just, they need to look at Japan first. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's, that's just... it's getting things moving again. It's always about circulation and motion. Let me throw you another curveball. <clears throat> um. If a bank would prefer to have a treasury or a mortgage-backed secure, let's say a, a T-bill, because you know you're, you're talking about how that's always pristine collateral. If they would prefer to have that treasury or T-bill than a bank reserve, why would they sell? Because the way I and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't I don't know of the regulation that requires the banks to sell those T-bills or treasuries to the Fed when the Fed is doing QE. If they didn't want those bank reserves, they simply wouldn't sell. Yeah, well, um, it, it who is selling to the Fed? That, I mean, who is selling in QE? And you got to remember that QE is uh, most of the time, it's not even focused on treasury bills anyway. But regardless. Um, or even mortgage-backed securities. Let's just say because the way I look at it is if I'm a bank – 
And I would prefer to have this mortgage-backed security than the equivalent amount of bank reserves. I'm just not going to sell. Exactly. But some banks might not have that preference. This is part of the problem that we have um, trying to trying to make everybody the same, right? It's treating the banking system as a monolithic whole, that every right. bank is the same as every other bank. So the, the Federal Reserve might say, I want to buy a bunch of treasury bills. And they, they start calling the banking system and half of the half of the banks hang up the phone. They don't want to sell to you, but they'll find some people, some banks that are willing to sell because of individual circumstances, individual, uh, individual mandates, whatever the case may be. They can always find somebody to sell them the treasury bills. It might be one bank that has absolutely no need from treasury bills is making a killing, selling them back to the Fed. I'm going to buy them at a price and sell them at a higher price. OK, the Fed. so there's a spread there that they might be able to pocket that would incentivize them to sell. Right. So they're not using treasury bills as a bank would as part of their you know, liquid collateral. They're using treasury bills as a dealer would. I'm just yeah. a money. I'm just a market maker with the Fed. Your house that's, not hard to, that's not hard to do. So again, <laughs> that's why I caution people to not treat these these things too simplistically, because you can't just say, "Why would a bank sell treasury treasury bill to the Fed?" Well, a lot of banks would. A lot of banks maybe not, maybe wouldn't, but you can always find somebody who's willing to do it at the right price. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to go back. Do you have, do you have a couple? I know we're getting been here an hour. Do you have a few more minutes? Let's keep going, George. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I know we have told people that uh, bank reserves really don't matter, and or at least they don't matter to the degree to which the mainstream media would like you to believe or the quote-unquote experts out there. And, and, and a lot of people, Jeff, ask me, George, so what? They say, so what? what? What difference does it make? And I say the reason this makes such a big difference is because most of the experts or the retail investors assume that if the Fed's balance sheet is doing this, well, then the stock market must do that, or liquidity must do that, or uh, bank lending will also do that. And my point to them is that, hey, if risk is a constant, let's just assume that it is, there, there's nothing to say that just because the Fed's balance sheet or the amount of bank reserves are going up is going to do anything. It, you have to first and foremost start from a standpoint of risk. And, and, and that's why I think this is so important. So uh, anyway, before we go on to why uh, the mechanics, let's say, as to why the banks don't have to settle on the Fed's balance sheet, you know, I think we need to go over some mechanics as to why is it that banks can create money? Why is it that banks, uh, or, or why doesn't the increase in bank reserves or the increase in money give them the ability to lend more money? So let, let's go over some of the charts and the diagrams that you have on uh, Euro Dollar University. Actually, before we do, Jeff, I just thought of one more question here. Um, and because this is a, a, a question that I get all the time, and I think it's a very good uh, question, is uh, let's assume the Fed bails out the system like the BTFP. Um, if they would not have set up the BTFP, I think there would have been a lot more banks that would have gone bust. And if the uh, if money or currency is simply a commercial bank deposit liability, if we had more banks going bust, then that likely would have decreased the uh, money supply or would have been very deflationary. So from that standpoint, do you think we could say that the Fed's balance sheet, if risk is constant, doesn't really matter? But if risk is skyrocketing and the Fed comes in and bails out a bank, it could be considered anti-deflationary. Um, yeah, I think there is an argument to be made there, though I'm I don't think it's all that much because even if there had been more failures last year, I don't believe it would have been tremendously deflationary from the standpoint of deposits because the FDIC would have absorbed them and redistributed them. Um, that's exactly what happens in every bank failure. The deposits are made whole and in some way, shape, or form, and it doesn't lead to a, a, a reduction in the money, monetary s supply. Even if they're uninsured deposits, there's still a way to be made. I mean, basically, that was that was the uh, the bigger issue back then. You know, Signature Bank had all these uninsured deposits, and when the uninsured depositor was, you know, thinking about what do I do here? What did they do? What did what did the insured depositors do? They left the banking system and went to a bank that they could rely on. So the uninsured depositor, even them, even though they were exposed to potential losses. The, 
they have such ease of movement. And that's what really created the, the, the bank failures to begin with, was the fact that the uninsured depositors went from them to, say, the, the bank that isn't going to fail. So I don't, I'm not sure that more bank failures would have led to a decrease in deposit, um, deposit money anyway. And to me, I still come back to the bigger part of last year was the real issue was the wholesale money circulation and repo. Why weren't these banks able to access alternative forms of funding, including the Fed's primary credit, which it's, that's not about deposits at all. I think that was the real downside risk there was that um, just like 2008, it was the interruption in the wholesale flow of funding. So, yeah, I, I get what people are saying. And if, if, if there's a crisis, the Fed comes in and it tries to absorb a lot of these, these uh, negative problems in, by, you know, putting out these four-letter four letter programs every once in a while, the PDCF or the BTFP or whatever the case may be, in order to try to restore function to the banking system. And you could argue, as the Federal Reserve has done repeatedly, that those had some positive impacts, although when you actually read the studies, the positive impacts are minuscule. But you know, it's it's still something. So yes, the Federal Reserve and central banks do have the ability to try to mitigate the effects and downside effects of a crisis. The debate isn't that; it's whether or not they're actually effective at doing so, or effective enough at doing so. Yeah, yeah. But I think it is fair to say that in ter- in in times of crisis, uh, their balance sheet would matter. Uh, just from a standpoint of them being able to bail the banks out. Uh, but it, but if you want to argue that, then so would J.P. Morgan, uh, because they could just bail the bank out or the government could just bail them out. Or um, uh, the example that I've used uh, that I've talked to you about is um, the regulatory change in 2009 for mark-to-market accounting yeah, and how that likely bailed out a lot of banks as well. So if we're going to say that the Fed's balance sheet is anti deflationary you also have to say that 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 is anti-deflationary there's a lot of things uh that could be anti-deflationary but for me it always goes back to the number one thing risk 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 and that's where if it's constant uh you know the fed's balance sheet uh, in my opinion doesn't matter at all um well, okay you also make one other counter argument yeah. i'll be i'll be quick with this that by doing that, you're you're interrupting the free market processes that actually short-term gain for long long run pain, yeah. right? Because you have a lot of dumbasses that did a lot of dumb things. Maybe they deserve to go out of business. <laughs> maybe there are banks that we shouldn't we shouldn't rescue, and maybe the private market was saying these idiots should not be running a bank. <laughs> and so what the Federal Reserve is saying is that yeah, we kind of agree with you, but we're we're stuck in a 1929 mindset where we believe that if we allow this much failure in these institutions, it'll lead to catastrophic consequence. In fact, that's what George Bush said. He got on TV and said, if I don't do TARP, it'll be the Great Depression. He freaking said that. It was just so idiotic. And so I think there's an argument there that we need to separate the failure of individual institutions from the failure of the whole system. Now, yes, the, the system was incredibly, it was in a really bad state and it was it created a, a, a whole lot of damage. But I would argue that the amount of damage would have been more in the short run, but it would have been much better in the long run. Yeah. 15 years of depression, we would have had maybe five really bad years and then real actual recovery from then so that by now we wouldn't be talking about any of this stuff. Yeah, I I would argue that the Fed maybe made the problem worse. And it's again, it's understandable why they did. They, they, they did what they thought was right because they were afraid of a 1929 case. Whether or not that was realistic is really the debate here. And that by bailing out individual institutions, that may not be the wise strategy either. Absolutely. Yeah, it's making a difference, but it's on net balance to making it worse over the long run. And that's the problem. I mean, how do you know? I mean, you can't blame them. You can't blame Bush. I mean, he had no idea what the hell he was talking about anyway. But you can't blame them for saying, you know, I know right now the the feces and the fans are getting really, are they're hitting the, the shit is really hitting the fan here. So how do I know that if I don't act, it won't be 1929. That's really the, the problem. And that, that type of short term narrow focus is understandable. If I think history has shown incorrect. Well, it's it, for me, that's, that's simple. Why they do that, Jeff is because they're, they're central planners and they believe that they're yes. smarter than everyone else. Because <laughs> they, in order to do what you're saying and just allow Schumpeter's creative destruction, nope. you have to believe that the right. free market is smarter than you are. Right. And, 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 and the central planners, the authoritarians, they can't do that. 
And they're also bureaucrats. Got to remember that too. So they're central planner bureaucrats, which is maybe the worst of the species. Yeah. Okay. So I know I've kind of gone back and forth here, guys. Uh, thank you for bearing with me. Let's go over to these charts. And now we're going to talk about uh, how the banks can settle without using reserves. I mean, how does this even happen? And so we, I think we can probably start with this one. This one is uh, pretty basic here. And this is actually something that you borrowed from Milton Friedman. So uh, we've got the uh, Euro dollar bank. That's the Bank H of London. And I think uh, you made the joke that uh, Friedman called this bank H for hypothetical. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, then you, and then you've got Morgan Guarantee of uh, New York City. So in this case, a sheik, an, an Arab sheik comes in and deposits, uh, gives a check for a million dollars to this bank of H in London. So do you want to take it from there, Jeff? Yeah, so what you have is, at the time, you have to keep in mind that one of the Depression-era regulations was still in, in effect, Regulation Q, which for all the wrong reasons limited the amount of, limited the interest rate that banks could pay on deposits. And so you had this burgeoning offshore Eurodollar market. In one respect, it became such a, such a growth thing because there's no, there's no regulation outside the United States, so they could pay more for deposits. So if you're a sheik, a wealthy sheik who's keeping your U U.S. dollar balances in the United States, Morgan Guarantee um, can only pay you up to Regulation Q. I don't remember what it was at the time, and it moved around a lot based on uh, based on uh, you know uh, regulatory views at the time. But essentially, the sheik says, "Why would I get paid, say, four percent for Morgan Guarantee yep. when I can I can on in U.S. dollar terms?" get 5% in London. It probably wasn't 5%. It was probably like 4.5% because euro dollar rates were pretty competitive. And so the sheik says, I'm going to take my money out of Morgan Guarantee and I'm going to move it to this bank in London who's going to give me a better rate. And so what happens? The sheik creates, or the sheik is, gets issued a check from Morgan Guarantee, which they then deposit in Bank H of London. Now Bank H in London has another million dollars in to its credit. Um, we'll get to that later. I think at this point, it's just, you know, simple. We moved the money from Morgan Guarantee to Bank H in London, Yep. Um, which means that now Bank H of London has a million dollars in cash, which it, uh, according to Friedman's assumptions, they thought, well, they'll hold 10% as a reserve. So that's the 100,000 there. And that reserve will be uh, Bank H of London's cash with Morgan Guarantee. So just to make things simple, they they keep that hundred thousand dollars in reserves as a correspondent balance with Morgan Guarantee, but then that frees up nine hundred thousand in U.S. dollars that Bank H of London can use as it sees fit. So why not make if you're going to keep a hundred thousand ten percent in reserve at Morgan Guarantee, why not make nine hundred thousand dollars in loans to somebody else around the rest of the world? Right. And again, this assumes a 10% reserve requirement, which they did not have. They have a 0% reserve that requirement. That was the res it, let, let's be clear about that. It's not a reserve requirement. It's yeah. not a law, it's not a regulation. What he was saying is that a bank, a prudent bank would would voluntarily withhold 10% because, you know, you want to you want to have enough liquid liabilities in case you have more payments than you can handle. Yeah. And I want to point out for uh, some people that watch a lot of my videos, uh, and this is a question that I had, uh, they may be asking, okay, where if the sheik is sending over or uh, Morgan Guarantee is sending over a million dollar deposit liability to Bank H, uh, that's fine, but they also have to transfer a, a, a million dollar asset or they have to decrease their liabilities by a million. That's another way that they could do it through a correspondent banking relationship or, or a Nostro Vostro account. Um, but uh, assuming that they transferred uh, an asset, now this asset wouldn't necessarily have to be bank reserves. It wouldn't necessarily have to be uh, green pieces of paper. It could simply just be an extension of credit from uh, uh, Morgan to Bank H. Uh, just simply say, you can go ahead and- um, It's an interbank. Or excuse transfer. me, yeah, it's an interbank transfer where Bank H could, I, I got it backwards there, where Bank H can extend credit to uh, Morgan and saying, hey, you can just pay me later. And then the offsetting 
asset would be the loan that Bank H just made to Morgan Guarantee. And then that, then this cash. million dollar liability, uh, instead of being a deposit liability, would become an IOU to Bank H of London. I just wanted That's, to make that clear because Jeff, the way you did this, uh, you you had it implied that there was a central bank, uh, not a central bank is the right word, but a central clearing house, a commercial risk. bank where that deposit liability would be held. Yes. There, I mean, in real, in, in actual practice, that's what would actually happen Yeah, is that there would be a clearing house or some other form of settlement mechanism that uh, there's a third party standing in between, but just for simplicity's purposes to understand the, and illustrate the concepts here. If we just think about the chic, not just actually transferring physical federal reserve notes, um, you know, a, a million dollars in physical federal reserve notes show up in London now they actually have the cash. They send 100000 back to New York as a reserve to have a liquid reserve in New York City. And then they have $900,000 in cash that they can then lend. But yes, in actual practice, we're not using cash. We're using interbank ledgers and uh, entries. Right. And I also want to point out that uh, this chart isn't the way Friedman set it up. It wasn't necessarily to illustrate interbank settlement. It was just basically to illustrate how uh, a U.S. bank, how their deposit liabilities could increase based on something that was happening offshore. And in this case, Morgan Guarantee was the proxy for the U.S. banking system. Yeah, and I think it was just because he was giving the speech at Morgan Guarantee. Oh, <laughs> <He's okay>. just, <laughs> well, you gotta remember, with Friedman's point here with this entire speech, and this it came it became a write-up afterward, was what he said at the beginning. He said the euro dollar market has gotten to be huge, and this is 1969. The euro dollar market's gotten to be huge, and I was le recently this is Friedman's words. I was recently listening to a guy who should know better. A, it sounded like somebody who was a bank president of an international bank mm. tried to explain where this euro dollar money came from. And he said it was just complete nonsense. So in Friedman's um, experience, you had bank people, you had Federal Reserve people, you had people who should know better, had no idea where all this euro dollar money was coming from. And so the, the point of this, this uh, the speech and then the article that he wrote on it was to illustrate where the euro dollar system came from and where all these dollars were coming from. Because they're not actually dollars. They're all just claims and interbank chains. All right. So where are these dollars, meaning commercial bank deposit liabilities denominated in dollars in the U.S., where they were all coming from if they're not being lent into existence by U.S. domestic banks? Right. They're actually lent into existence by foreign banks. Right. There you go. Okay. So now let's move to the next uh, chart that we've got. And uh, that's now we're taking it and adding some more banks. This is more of what we would consider the banking network that is the euro dollar system. Yeah. So from the earliest days, what you read in some of the earliest scholarship is that they were amazed what the euro dollar did. Again, money of motion. It's all about circulation and motion. So you had a bank that had some kind of cash claim, doesn't matter what it was, say in Switzerland, they have cash but they don't have any, any real good opportunities around in Switzerland. So what a lot of interbank development had been is to move money from where it was to where it could be used. And the, inter, the euro dollar system took that several steps further. So now we have money in Switzerland, but it needs to be used in Thailand. How the hell do we get money from Switzerland to Thailand in the 1950s or 1960s or even the 70s and 80s? So we develop all of these markets, these euro dollar markets, and they're really chains of different markets that work together. And what ends up happening is the bank in Switzerland has the cash. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be it could be local Swiss francs. It could be any denomination. Mm -hmm. It gets swapped into U.S. dollars, and then the magic happens. And the magic is that it goes from one bank to the next until it finds a f eventual use. So all of these chains of liabilities are money just moving from one perception to the next until it actually finds that end state where, okay, how do I get the money to Thailand? Well, there's probably a repo transaction to somebody in the Cayman Islands. That's the Bank of Milo Grand Cayman. And then they probably do a transaction, a short-term money transaction to the next bank in Singapore. And then it goes over to Montreal. And it just keeps going through these interbank networks until eventually you get up to the red part there. What is that? Eurodollar Enterprises. That's a meals company. It gets to Eurodollar Enterprises. It finds its final use. And then it becomes, guess what? 
a bank loan, <laughs> which means it gets redeposited back into the system and we go around and around and around and around. Mm -hmm. So as long as the money is moving from where it started to where it all ends up and it moves in between, it's a very elegant solution to motion, to uh, mobilize what otherwise would be idle cash. And I want to point out that the settlement asset in all of these transactions is simply bank credit. It is not dollars. It is not green pieces of paper. It is not bank reserves. It is just simply bank credit. Is that correct, Jeff? Yeah, but it gets it looks a little more complicated. We were just talking about this before uh, before we started here. If we were being more realistic, what we would see is that there would be dealer banks in between all of these transactions. You don't normally have two small banks say transacting directly with one another, as I've got as I've got a diagram here. That was just more to illustrate the concept, like Friedman okay. was doing. In more actual practice, you have financial utilities and really correspondent banks that actually act as settlement agents and clearing uh, clearing entities. So you, these arrows would actually be intersecting with uh, third-party dealer banks that actually um, both create the settlement mechanism as well as do the actual settlement process. So in many cases, it's sometimes it's it's a credit through a, a, a third-party settlement bank that Again, to your point, it's not Federal Reserve uh, Bank Reserves. It's not actual green pieces of paper. We have a dealer bank that is saying, I will make good on these all of these claims if I have to. And make good by doing what? Extending credit. Exactly. Not not giving you bank reserves or not giving you green pieces of or paper. Physical, exactly. It's I will, if I have to, I'll give you part of my balance sheet. That's right. Yeah, and I'm and gonna take I'm gonna take a credit that that uh, Bank of Milo Grand Cayman has a credit with me. I'm going to give you that credit for a short period of time. And if I'm going to go back to Bank of Emile and say, look, if this guy defaults, then, um, you know, if it's a collateralized thing, then I, I'll, I'll stand I'll stand behind it somehow. But it's 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 all a private arrangement between financial counterparties in the system. And it gets incredibly complicated because usually they're not one. They're not singular transactions. There's usually all sorts of ha things happening all over the place at the same time. Yeah, but it's they, it's a daisy chain of what are effectively IOUs. Yeah, it's all, I almost think of it like electron clouds. You know, you have those simple electron, you know, that you're taught in school where electrons orbit around a neutron. Well, in reality, they're they're fuzzy clouds. That's really what the euro dollar system is. But really, again, the th the thing to keep in mind that's most important is that it it's the euro dollar system moves cash uh, from where it is to where it should go or where it needs to go or where people. Well, people demand it, so it's and, a, and it's not a cash, massive... Jeff. It, it, let's be clear: it doesn't move cash. It use it, it moves uh, commercial bank deposit liabilities, right? Which, which we are just simply IOUs, cash, and that's right. it. Credit, but yeah. that's but see, that's the secret behind it. By calling these U.S. dollars, people get the idea that we're moving U.S. dollars around, which allowed for a couple of things. You know, allowed for the banking system to say, "Okay, we're we're just doing dollars here. This is this is all really safe and reliable. This is all just U.S. dollar system." When in fact, it's really not. It's actually something different, which is why I correct people when they say the reserve currency is the dollar. I say, no, the reserve currency is actually the euro dollar. Yeah. And that's not a, a trivial distinction. Um, and and, again, and then, the, okay, go, go ahead. I'm sorry there, Jeff. No, say, again, just, just to reiterate, the point here is to move money or you know commercial bank liabilities from one place to the next as efficiently as possible rather than having it sit doing nothing in various places around the world. And that's really the secret behind the wave of globalization and emerging markets emerging from you know the depths of really uh, uh, historic poverty, because we we had a system that created and moved money as necessary in a way that humanity had never had never seen before. Right now, the the pushback there, Jeff, is going to be well, okay, I understand all this, I get the euro dollar system, but let's be honest, these are simply claims on bank reserves. These are simply claims on the Fed's balance sheet. So no matter how many of these claims go back and forth, at the end of the day, that, that's just what they are, is claims. And at some point in time, this system cracks and it goes straight back to the Fed's balance sheet. No, that's technically correct, but functionally meaningless. Right. <laughs> right? It's a, yes, all of these IOUs are technically a claim. When I when I give you an interbank loan, what I'm saying is that if you if you need to, 
I will give you physical Federal Reserve notes or I will somehow get you bank reserves, which doesn't really apply here because bank reserves don't go outside the United States. You know, I'd have to set up an account with a U.S. bank that has the ability to settle in bank reserves, which means we still have a correspondent relationship anyway. Right. But essentially, it's technically correct. That's where the euro dollar system came from. A deposit liability is a claim on another asset. What we're saying here is that euro dollar system developed without ever needing to exercise that claim. We have a reserve asset that nobody uses. It actually, it just, it's like an appendix. It, it, it's there, but nobody ever uses it. We don't know why it's still there. So the, the claims on those reserve assets actually became the money behind the entire system. Nobody wants, we said before, nobody wants physical, physical cash. It's too cumbersome and costly to use. It's much more efficient to use what are technically claims on cash, but are in effect their own form of money. I think that's the key there. That's what people have to understand is that, is there less risk with bank reserves or base money? Yes, absolutely there is. But the banks aren't used. Is a higher cost, a hell of a lot higher cost. But, but that's my point: is that when you is there less risk? Yes, but there's way less reward. Right, less. Yes, so, exactly. so when you're actually looking at the cost benefit analysis and trade offs, it, it it makes sense for these banks to not settle and to treat, let's just call it broad money, uh, just just like base money, or just to treat a claim from J.P. Morgan exactly or a credit from jp morgan an iou from jp morgan as good as a, a green piece of paper or a bank reserve that's really what we're talking about i think that's uh, George, it's actually it better it's um when you go back to the fractional reserve systems i've been doing in some recent videos at Eurodollar university what i'm telling people is that base money what they think of as base money is actually idle money and bank money is money that moves so the more we have bank money, the more we have motion and circulation. The more we have base money, chances are it's not going to move anywhere, even if it is base money. So because base money goes up when risk goes up. Exactly. It's it's and fundamental economics. Down. Right. right. It's it's when risk goes down, money moves. Money, you know, we have all of these these uh these other forms of money that moves around. So if you have more base money in the system, that's not a good sign. That means it's not likely to move around. If you have banks that are going through these interbank euro dollar channels. That means money's moving, credit's being made, the economy's moving, everything is going the way it should go, um, because economy is motion. It's it's not about stagnation. It's not about um, you know holding liquid assets at the low at the best possible return I can get that's safe. Um, so the more you have of that form of money, that's not a good sign. Yeah, I think the easiest way for people to understand this, the way I see it in my mind, is I can choose if I'm a bank. I can choose to have one of two forms of IOUs. Either I can have an IOU from the Fed, which is absolutely risk-free, and get paid, let's say, 5%. Or I can have an IOU from a Eurodollar bank, or let's just say an IOU from JP Morgan, which has pretty much the same uh, probability of risk of going out of business as the Fed does. Because I would argue they own the Fed, <laughs> right? But that's a whole other uh, video. But if, if I could choose to have an IOU from the Fed as an asset on my balance sheet at 5% or an IOU from JP Morgan at 8%, well, I'm probably going to take the IOU from JP Morgan at 8%. You say, well, why, George? It's, it's riskier. Well, yeah, but it's not that much riskier. And I'm being paid for that risk to a level that I'm comfortable with. And, and that's pretty much what we're saying here. That's why the banks, the Euro dollar system was created. Uh, that's why there's all, all this offshore settlement. That's why they don't use reserve. That's why they don't use dollars because the, the risk reward, the rate of return uh, is, is better. Go um, backwards to that. Let's, let's reverse engine. Let's go backwards. Yeah. Why is JP Morgan paying you 8%? Because well, they just, think I'm, I have an I'm, opportunity. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying that I, I I should have been clear there. I wasn't no, no, saying. No, I'm just saying. Let's. I, let's I'm just let's saying that the bank. the other direction because it explains exactly what you're talking about. So J.P. Morgan is paying is willing to pay eight percent because they're thinking I've got an opportunity on the other side of the planet that I can take advantage of. So I'll pay you eight percent, but I'm gonna get I'm gonna get paid fifteen percent over there. So what happens when J.P. Morgan says? Oh, I look at the other side of the planet and it no longer looks so good. They're willing to pay 15 or even 20%, but the risk to me is huge. So now I don't I don't really want to lend to the other guy on the other side of the planet. So I'm not really willing to pay you 8% for your money. 
So what are you going to do? You're going to leave it at the Fed. Everything in reverse makes sense too. When the system starts to break down and there's too much risk in it, money stops flowing and rates kind of go down and settle to their, whatever the equilibrium um, inertia is, the lack, the idleness. You get you get an idle rate that that's, that's the bottom for this. And if there's no opportunity, no risk adjusted opportunity out there, everything just kind of sits still. Yeah, right. And and just for the viewers to be clear, I wasn't implying that JP Morgan or the euro dollar system would pay you that much of an interest rate. I was simply saying that by not settling on the Fed's balance sheet, you would have the opportunity to have a greater return based on those assets. That's what I was saying. You know, however you utilize those assets. But the returns are there because opportunities there, things are moving, everything's in motion. That's yep. I think the, the other I mean the point's still there and um and that's your example is exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jeff, we've gone an hour and a half, buddy. Tell everyone and by the way, I want to remind people <laughs> that you're going to be speaking at uh Rebel Capitals Live. Yeah, I'm looking so, forward to that. Really. Yeah, if you want to see Jeff, meet him, have a beer with him. Uh, ask him a question directly or hear his presentation. We got Mike Green. Uh, it's going to be there as well. Uh, our good buddy, Kenny McElroy, Richard Cooper. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff, freedom, liberty, economics, the monetary system. It's going to be fantastic. So you can get your tickets at Rebel Capitals Live now or rebelcapitalslive.com. Now, if they want to check out Euro Dollar University, Jeff, how can they do that? Just check us out at our website, eurodollar.university. I've got a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. Actually, it's less than a couple of weeks, February 19th. The details on the webinar are on the homepage at eurodollar.university. It's President's Day, February 19th, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We haven't settled on a topic yet. We're still getting feedback, but I bet you it's going to be some, some important current event because uh, there's more than enough to talk about. But if you want details, it's at the website, eurodollar.university. All right, buddy. Thanks again for coming on. My pleasure, George.